What is so great to see you, Church of the Highlands. I just want to take a moment before we go any farther to welcome all of our campuses all across the state of Alabama and over in Georgia. We love you guys a ton. Everybody joining us online or on demand, and of course, the uh, men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities. Come on, church family, put your hands together and let's welcome everybody who's with us right now. And I just, even going through that list, I know it's something we do uh, every single week when we kind of welcome everybody because we are one church, but I just was reflecting today how incredible that is that God has brought all of us together. And I just, can I tell you guys how I feel it today? Our church is awesome. I mean, this is a miracle. Oh my goodness. And so honored to have everybody with us. And especially those who are here for the first time, I know we've already welcomed you at every location, but I actually had the chance this week just in town around to meet a couple different families that are at Highlands. Uh, One had just come for the very first time and one has been here just for a few weeks or a couple months. And so I know there may be a lot of you, I'm I'm expecting there are a lot of you here today for the first time or in in a new season. And we don't take that for granted. We're so glad you're here and we're just praying you experience God today. Come on church family, can you agree with that? Just put your hands together for again for all those who are new. And we are so glad you're with us. Well, I'm excited, like I really, really can't wait for today. I couldn't hardly sleep last night excited uh, for this, this moment, because we're in a series that I think is so important uh, called the What the Bible is All About. And it's, it was, I mean, Pastor Chris kicked us off last week. It was incredible. Only PC can preach the entire Old Testament in 35 minutes. Okay, does anybody want to trade jobs with me right now? Because like this is, this, I, I called one, one of my best friends is Mayo, Pastor Mayo Sowell, who pastors our church over in Atlanta. And I said, you're not gonna believe this. I'm I'm preaching this week. And last week, PC preached the whole Old Testament in 35 minutes. He literally just started laughing out loud. He was like, good luck, you know? Um, So I love our pastor and just grateful that he set us up. And now I get a chance to preach just four books, Uh, but that's a lot for me. So anyway, can y'all pray for me? But we're gonna hit the gospels today, so excited. And then next week, we're gonna talk about the book of Acts as the, the early church grows and then cover the rest of the New Testament. And of course, this is just an overview But our goal is really just to invite you into a relationship with the living word of God, Um, because the Bible is important. It's, it's It's crucial for us to experience God, especially in the times we live in. I'm so grateful that in the craziness of this world, we have the solid rock of the word of God. That is perfect and unchanging. And so we're just gonna jump in that today. And if you're taking notes, we'd love you. Honestly, this is the best series ever uh, to take notes. It's kind of like more like a classroom than a preach. In fact, I brought, look at all these books. Are y'all ready for this? I don't think y'all are ready for this today. We're gonna, we may be here for like, I don't know, a long time. And, in, and even I even have a clicker. Oh, just wait for this coming later, all right? So anyway, so we're gonna jump in, take notes. And I'm gonna do my best to, to, to give an overview today as we jump into God's word. But I, I did wanna just take a moment to come alongside even what uh, Pastor Chris shared last week just about why this series is so important. And, the, and we already mentioned this, the Bible is important. And I just picked three verses just to really lean into uh, what I believe you can experience today and every day in your walk with God. And yeah. this is Matthew chapter four. It says, Jesus answered, it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, we all are here in the South. We love a good meal, some good barbecue, some wings, you know, watching college football on a Saturday. Like, we, of course, nourish ourselves with physical food. But how much more important is is it for us to have spiritual food? And if you've never recognized that, the word of God actually nourishes you in a level that no, no food and no experience here on earth can, and it feeds us. And it's, it's the life that we can live off of. It, it brings life when we uh, take in God's word. Another great verse, Psalm 119. I love this verse, especially for young people and growing up in, in, in you know, what career path and where do I go to college and how do I make decisions? Well, hey, everybody, the word of God is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. And if you feel like you're in a dark place right now and you don't know what to do, God's word is a beautiful way to illuminate his plans and purposes. And we need to always recognize that it's, it's, it nourishes us, but it's also a guide. And then finally, Romans chapter 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we are also able as we dig into God's word to fuel our faith. And I believe with all of my heart, that's why every single person, if there's one reason we're all at church today, it's this right here, is we wanna grow in our faith and, and God's word is gonna do that for us. So God's word is important. God's word is incredible, but here's also the truth, and that is that God's word can be intimidating. And I believe that's why this showed up, this, qu- this question or this, this uh, topic show, showed up in our Easter survey. Hey, tell us more about the Bible, uh, because it can be intimidating, and it can feel very daunting to approach this you know, ancient text 
and to learn from it and to grow from it. And so we recognize that and that's really the heart behind the whole series is to unpack that. But on a, a, on a larger scale than even us as a church, I found some research this week that honestly, I literally grieved over when I saw it, but then the, the Holy Spirit also kind of gave me a, a word today and I wanted to share it um, just to create, I think there's, a, there's a, a levity to it, but also there's a faith that we can have right here. And this is research that Lifeway has done about Bible engagement in America. So as you see, starting back in 2011, uh, they, they looked at adult Bible users in America and we've had a, a lot of consistency and there's been some peaks. I even see that peak in 2021. Uh, probably related to the pandemic. Like people were like, hey, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to make it through life. And they were looking at God's word. But here's, here's what was shocking for me. This is the last two years. And of course, in this graph, and I'm not sure with, throughout American history, there's ever been a moment, like that's kind of a cliff. And that's the part that I definitely grieved over. It's just, but then I sat there and pondered and even prayed over this. You know, what, what is going on here? And there's probably a lot of reasons why. But I do believe one of the reasons why is something that we all can be entrusted with to be a solution for, and that is I believe a lot of people approach God's word and they don't know what to do with it. In fact, when this research was done, uh, they asked people, you know, why? Why Why do you find it difficult or why have you stopped engaging God's word? Listen to the four of the top six answers. This, This may be you, but I guarantee it, it's your neighbor, it's probably a family member. They said things like, we don't know where to start. We have difficulty relating to it. The layout can kind of be confusing for us and we don't know how to apply these stories. And so this is a beautiful, I have faith that if we can just unpack it, if we can give people handles to God's word, starting with all of us, that that can take what has been daunting and distant and make it approachable and engaging. And in a nutshell, that is our heart for this series. And I know that's happened in my own life. So I brought a couple of Bibles, uh, my Bibles, Pastor Chris brought one of his Bibles last week. This is my Bible. Uh, growing up, I, was, I received this Bible. Uh, I grew up Methodist. This was my confirmation Bible. And so I got this Bible when I was six years old. And of course, they wanted me to understand it, so they gave me a King James Bible at six years old. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It has amazing maps. Like these maps right here, like I can remember looking. I don't know if I ever, this is so crisp. I don't know if I ever read a single word, but these maps and pictures, they are worn out. Can I get an amen from the map readers in church today? I feel your pain. So this was daunting and distant, and I'm not just even about the, the, the translation. For me, no relationship. It was on a shelf. I mean, it was just, it's, it looks, other than it's really old now, because I'm getting older, it would be brand new. It was just, it's never been used. And then when I was 17 years old, I got saved, and my parents bought me uh, my first Bible after I gave my heart to Jesus. And it was in that season where I had mentors and pastors, where I had a true hunger for God's word, and I had people to help guide me to where it wasn't just distant and daunting, now it was approachable and relatable. Y'all, this sucker is worn out. I mean, it's got highlights. I even had to put duct tape on it. I did, this was in college, I didn't have the money to get it rebound, and so I put duct tape on it. And normally duct tape fixes everything, right? Not so with the word of God. Because look, my Bible now starts with the book of Ruth. The rest of it fell <laughs> Hey, this is the best Bible ever for the one year Bible though. You finish in July, you're done. It's like, <laughs> you're done with it. So anyway, so this, this, is, this, is, this is our heart. I, I experienced, the difference between, in my own life between this and this was huge. And we want you to have this and we want the world to have this. I think we have that opportunity. Listen, is that a problem? Yes. Do we see that this is creating chaos in our world because we need something like the word of God to stand on? Yes, but God has called us to this moment. And so let's first receive ourselves and then help the world. Uh, experience God in a real way. So today, as I mentioned, we're gonna hit the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these are the first four books of the New Testament. And they're, they're incredibly important, incredibly important books. And so to help kind of guide us through how we can approach and experience these, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of answer five different questions today that I think maybe you've been asking, you're asking, or uh, maybe you know someone that is asking. And the first one I think we have to start with is, you know, what is the Gospel? Itself, like we say gospel all the time, what, is, what does that even mean? The word is an English translation for a Greek word that is pronounced euangelion, which means good news. So uh, I grew up in the country and, and um, I, grew up, I went to school in this little small community called Lineville, it's in Clay County over, over near Mount Cheha. Um, but I lived in a suburb of, of Lineville, which if you were from Lineville, that would be funny because the town is so small, but I lived in a suburb called Delta. But between Lionville and Delta was even a smaller town. Come on, where are my country folks at? Y'all know what it's like to be, it's, yeah. it's called Barfield. To be in a town that has more cows and chickens than people, wow. that is country, all right? That's Barfield. And, and my grandparents had a farm there. They, they, they um, had a few hundred acres and they raised livestock. And it was a great place to have fun as a kid. It was like, it was like paradise. We would go, we would play, we'd be far away from the home. And when my grandmother would cook dinner, 
Um, there was no cell phones or even pagers or whatever. She, she had to call us in. So she, had cooked, she would cook a great dinner, but we were so far away, we wouldn't know that it was finished. It was, it was ready. And so we actually had this bell. She had this bell in her front yard, this huge bell. And she would go, a dinner bell. She would go out and ring that thing. We could be like a mile away and we would come running. Take that image and apply it to this good news. It's not just good news that's created. It's good news that's proclaimed. That is the gospel. Hey, it's great that we have this dinner. We have this good news, but we got to ring the bell. And that's why we also get the word evangelism from this. And we also get evangelist from this word euangelion. It is the proclaimed good news of Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful um, opportunity we have to be entrusted with the gospel of Jesus. So the early Christians had this word, but it wasn't the word that they created. I think this is just, if this is maybe just fun facts, but I think this is so fascinating. It tells us a lot about our roots is actually early Christians kind of stole this word, euangelion. It was already being used in Rome. In fact, there was already a gospel in Rome called the gospel of Caesar that had existed before uh, Jesus lived on earth. This is actually an inscription uh, in modern day Turkey that was found. It says, the birthday of Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel concerning him. I think this is awesome that the early Christians found a cultural connection, this word that was already being used about a different kingdom. And they basically said this, you've heard of the gospel of Caesar, but you ain't heard nothing yet. And they didn't avoid culture. They went right at the heart of culture in a way they could understand. And they said, hey, hey, this is, you know, the gospel of Caesar, it's all about a kingdom here on earth. And they even called him Lord. They called him savior. There were even Roman churches. And the early Christians said, oh, no, no, no. This is the real kingdom. His is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the authority forever and ever. And it was a way for culture to relate uh, to the gospel. Here's, a, here's just a clean definition if you want it. Uh, it's in your app notes, but just for us. What is the gospel? The gospel is the proclaimed good news of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, offering salvation and reconciliation with God to all who believe. And I know this is more classroom style, but can we put our hands together and thank God for the gospel that someone shared with each of us proclaimed? Thank God that the gospel has been proclaimed to us. And so this gospel is not just in the four books, the four four first books of the New Testament. This gospel is from Genesis to Revelation. But in those first four books, we get a focused account of Jesus's life here on earth. And that's, of course, uh, what we're going to dig into today. Here's the next question. And that is, you know, why are there four gospels? So to answer this one, I actually want to tell a little bit of a, a story And, uh, you know, Pastor Chris has shared he's big on British history. I I don't know much about British history. Uh, I know of the highlights, the Mayflower, uh, Winston Churchill, and Downton Abbey. That's all all I got. That's all I got. Uh, But I do know this, that the current king is King Charles III. Back in the 1600s, uh, the king in England was Charles I. And at some point, someone wanted to have a, a bust or a statue made of Charles I. But the best artist in the world wasn't in London. The best artist in the world was in Rome. And he wasn't coming to London for any, even for a king. So they had this problem to fix. And that is, how do we communicate the likeness, the image, all of who the king is to this artist so that the art he creates reflects the trueness of the identity of the king? I think this is fascinating. Of course, this is before the, long before the internet or any way to communicate otherwise. They actually, in London, hired a different artist who would paint different angles of Charles I. This is actually the painting that was created. So this artist took time to create all these different angles and then they took that and they mailed it over to London, however that happened, and this was what was created. I believe this may be the best explanation if you've ever wondered why for Gospels. Because God was communicating the image of who he is. But to do that to people who had never seen it, he needed more than just one angle so that collectively through all four gospels, we get the fullness of who God is. It takes four to give us the fullness, the picture God wanted us to have of who Jesus is. All four accounts are are really are pictures that lead to one beautiful portrait. Isn't that great, everybody? So that we can authentically and accurately see the fullness of Jesus and the power of his ministry. I am grateful for God. The intentionality and throughout God's word is just amazing. So I wanna come back to really more of these pictures. In fact, the biggest part of today's teaching is gonna be digging into each of the four gospels and talking about the pictures they show us. But I, a little bit of a, of a, not a rabbit trail, but a, just, a, just a moment I wanna pause, and that is with the next question. 
And that is maybe you're out there wondering this or you've ever wondered this, and maybe not just about the gospels, but about God's word in general. And that is, you know, why are there differences in the accounts of the gospels? And this is, I'm really passionate about this because I think sometimes we can feel like um, when we have questions, we can be ashamed or insecure or just not even know what to do with those. And I just wanna say this to anyone who has questions, young and old, wherever you are, questions are never a bad thing. And I wanna make sure, come on church, we need to always be a place where people can bring their questions. And so if you're asking questions like this, if you're confused at any level about God's word, bring those questions in. Uh, When I was first on the team here at Highlands, uh, someone invited, I was a youth pastor here, and someone invited me to meet a guy named Josh McDowell. Anybody ever heard of Josh McDowell? So he, he's a Christian apologist, and I'd, I'd read um, some of his books. He has this book called More Than a Carpenter I had read, and he had these, these other books. And so I was like, this is the most famous Christian I have ever, I could not sleep the night before. I mean, this was the first celebrity I'd ever met. That's a Christian celebrity. So anyway, it's kind of an oxymoron. But so, so I, I get invited, I go meet this guy. We're at the Marriott on 280. I am so pumped. And this is, this is how I always think when I meet somebody, they're gonna be my best friend. Come on, y'all out there, anybody out there like that? They're gonna, they're gonna love me. Why would they not love me? And so I'm like, I'm on mission. Like, this guy's gonna love me, all right? We're gonna have the best time. We're gonna have breakfast. And so we go, it's a buffet. We, we serve our plate. I'm, I'm kind of nervous. We sit down and he's mostly talking to the guy that he knows that, who's, who brought me. And he kind of finally turns his attention to me. And, and instead of like building a friendship, I feel like I'm on trial. And I mean, I know this guy's like, he actually has whole books about questions. He just starts asking me all these questions. And like, I may at this point, I mean, I'm hopefully a strong Christian. I mean, I'm a youth, the youth pastor at Church of the Highlands. And within three or four questions, I can't answer anymore. I'm like giving, I'm like, he is, instead of being my friend, I feel like he's getting me fired. That's what I feel like is happening. I'm like, don't tell Pastor Chris, you know? So, so I, I, I sit there and he asked me all these questions. And then really the lesson of the whole day was, and he was mentoring me. I didn't ask for it. But he did, and I'm grateful because it's marked my life. The, the whole mentorship was, hey, you do know, teen, as a youth pastor, he's like, teenagers are asking questions, yeah. and you need to be ready for that. Yeah. So church, at, at whatever age you are, journey, let's be ready for those questions. And if you are here and you have questions, we want to tell you, you are in the right place. Right. And it will be our honor through small right. groups and through one-on-one right. conversations and really through what happens here on S- Sundays and Wednesdays to take you on that journey of faith. And it's, it, that's exactly what it is. It's a journey. And even Jesus describes himself as a shepherd that leads you on a pathway to green pastures. And so don't hold those questions back. If you're looking for some good resources, um, I brought a book from my very best friend. His name is Josh McDowell. Have you ever heard of him? This guy, <laughs> he loves me, he loves me. I think he's somewhere preaching right now about this dumb youth pastor in Alabama. Anyway, anyway so, but this is an incredible book that's just full of just, as it said, evidence about not just the gospels, but the entire uh, Bible and just the truth of God's word using archeology span and many other um, ways to, to authenticate. And then this is a book from a, one of my professors in seminary that I, this is in my heart today. And this is more of a classroom, but just from at a very much pastoral level, I recognize today that we may have some people here who the current term is deconstructing, that you're walking through a crisis of faith. And this is a book that is called After Doubt that is for anyone in that situation. Um, There's other books out there, but this is one that's ministered to many of my friends that I know. And if you're there, hey, we want you to know it's okay. This is what I would say to you, though. Ask your questions. Just ask them to the right people. And allow God to do it, to allow God to do what only he can. And so, church, one more. Can you just put your hands together for anyone who's in that situation right there? We love you. We're glad you're here. And so, uh, back to the gospel specifically, there are differences. Um, there are things different like this. In Matthew, there are, are, are two um, angels, or excuse me, in Luke, there are two angels at the tomb. In Matthew, there's one angel at the tomb. Um, in Luke, we see Jesus, the story of his birth, go from Nazareth to Bethlehem and then back to Nazareth. And then in, in Matthew, we see it go from Bethlehem, where he's born, uh, down to Egypt and then back to Nazareth. But I wanna make this really clear, and this would be true of the whole Bible, because uh, there's other examples of differences in the, in the Gospels. There are differences, and I would love you to write this down, but there are no contradictions. And honestly, those differences are some of the most um, important marks of the authenticity of God's word. And to explain that, I wanna read uh, just a a quote to you from a guy named Dr. Henry Van Dyke. He said, if four witnesses should appear before a judge to give an account of a certain event, and each should tell the exact same story in the exact same words, the judge would probably conclude not that their testimony was exceptionally valuable, 
but that the only event which was certain beyond a doubt was, what they had, was that they had agreed to tell the same story. Some of y'all, your parents, kids have done that to you before. You're like, y'all are lying because there's, there's no way. But if each man had told what he had seen as he had seen it, then the evidence would be credible. And when we read, when we read the Gospels, this, it's not, when we, when, and when we read the four Gospels, it's not, is that not exactly what we find? The four men tell the same story uh, each in his own yeah. way. And it's a beautiful explanation. Remember back to that painting of these four angles of Jesus that create this one portrait. And it's a powerful mark of authenticity uh, of God's word. So here, here we are kind of dialing in towards the gospels themselves. And this is, this is the heart of the message, these next few moments. I'm gonna take a moment and really answer this question about what, you know, what do these gospels tell us about Jesus? And I feel as I was writing this, just that there, they, this could come across as information. I'm, I'm praying that even as we go through this, which I, I know many of you, all of you are excited to get the information, but more than information, I'm praying that it will be an impartation. Um, because what we see when we see the gospels is an opportunity for us to, to not take something at surface level, but even as we walk through these four things, but just to recognize that they're an invitation to dig in. That, In fact, the deeper you dig, the better God's word will get. And so today we can't cover all of that, but I'm praying it would almost create just the hunger inside of each of us um, to keep going, dig, uh, digging deeper. Philippians 2 says this, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more so in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that phrase right there, it actually creates this kind of word picture of a gold mine. I love that. That all of our salvation and God's word included is like a, mine, a gold mine where you just keep going in and there's more and more riches. When you have a gold mine that is full of gold, you don't just go, just go in once. You keep going back and back and back. It's, it's like a toddler. I, we had some friends over on Friday night and they have a, a, a beautiful little girl named Fletcher. And y'all, I, being a dad of four boys, if you're a girl dad out there, I don't know how you handle it. I would just tell her yes always. Like she would be so spoiled. But she was at our house and we had, we had cookies and she kept coming and you've seen this before. She kept coming to her dad saying, more? You know what I'm talking about? And okay, here, this is the last one. And she'd come back and she'd say, more? And she had this smile on her face and these light in her eyes, more? Can I tell you, that's the posture that God would love us to have with his word. That's good. That's good. Man, that first bite was good. good, Mark. good. More? Yeah. When, when my brother was little, this is horrible. My dad actually, I remember this this morning. My dad actually one time, he, he was, my brother was doing that, Stephen, who's in the service. Um, he, he, uh, sorry, Stephen, I didn't ask permission. But anyway, so uh, he was at, I think we had Cheerios or something. It was before Goldfish. Uh, I feel robbed as a kid. We didn't have Goldfish, but he was asking for like Cheerios and it was like more, more. And so finally my dad was exhausted. We, we had this glass table. He just put a bunch on the top of the table and he put Stephen underneath it and he was like doing this. And, and, and he's had therapy. He's fine. He, he's good. So, so let's, but let's have that childlike posture. Can we, can we have that childlike posture? We've got more. And, and every time we ask, God is faithful. Here, here's a, a beautiful quote, and I'm gonna move into the gospels, but never be content with your current grasp of the gospel. The gospel is the life permeating, world altering, universe changing truth. It has more facets than a diamond. Its depths mankind will never exhaust. One person was gonna clap, but that's not enough. Let's all clap. That's the gospel. All right, so... Now to the clicker, because I'm going to go through this, all right? So here we go. I want you to write these down and just we'll catch these as we move through. We'll start with the book of Matthew. It is the first of the four Gospels. In Matthew, kind of the life-altering concept that we're introduced to is the fact that Jesus is a king. Now, the author, of course, as, as is named, is from Matthew. But what's important for you to know if you're introduced to this book for the first time is that Matthew had formerly been a tax collector. And in the Jewish culture, a tax collector would have been viewed as, as an enemy because even though he was Jewish, he had basically sided with Rome and he was part of the oppression of the Jewish people. And so the fact that God would redeem this God, in fact, his name originally was Levi. The word Matthew means Yahweh's gift. You can, you can just see that his entire identity had been changed by Jesus. That this is yeah. the last person you would ever expect to write a book yeah. of the Bible. And, and it's just amazing, it's just a picture of, of God's grace. And so it's also really intentional because Matthew, of course, was precise as a tax collector. And he also understood the culture that he was writing to and the customs of the culture. And so his audience, his, his oh, by the way, this is a picture of him. Um, I totally forgot. It's one of the 
few pictures. That's a horrible joke. This one, where are you chosen people at? All right, yeah, you're out there. Okay, so. so, all right, so the audience uh, is, is the Jewish people, and he's really targeted on, on this audience, and, he, and he's writing them to, to really con- convince them that, that Jesus isn't just another rabbi or teacher, but that he is actually the Messiah. And so this book opens with a genealogy, uh, but in starting with Abraham, it, it's a royal genealogy. He's, he's, he's writing that intentionally to show his audience, hey, this isn't just some random teacher. This is the king. This is the lion of Judah. This is the Messiah. And he has been, he has been prayed for and believed for, but he has shown up. Matthew is also very intentional in revealing Jesus as the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. So there are actually over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. And hey everybody, Jesus fulfills all of those. Yeah. So there's these 300 right. prophecies all throughout the Old Testament and we find more of those fulfillments in the book of Matthew. And I just found some research. I think this, is just, this just builds faith for the power of God's word. So there's 300 total of these prophecies uh, of, uh, a Christian mathematician named Peter Stoner did some research on this. And, and if you just took eight of these, we're not even talking about all 300, it, the probability of fulfilling just eight of those prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power, which looks like that number. And that would be hard for any of us to grasp. And so he actually, and you may have heard this before, he actually wrote out essentially what that would look like. He says, suppose you took the state of Texas and spread silver dollars two feet deep across the whole state, then marked out just one of them, marked on one of them, and buried it somewhere in the state. Then if you chose one person, blindfolded him, and told him to pick up just one silver dollar, his chances of getting the marked one on his first try would be one in 10 to the 17th power. That's just one, and this is just, or just eight of those prophecies of chance, and there are over 300. Matthew's stressing, and all of God's word is making sure we understand, this is not just a rabbi, teacher, good man, and some people wanna think that about Jesus. This is the king. He's the Messiah. And his book then closes with the Great Commission because a king has, has authority, right? And then what does the Great Commission say? I have the authority, now I'm giving that authority to you. So the ultimate message, if you wanna write this down, is, of Matthew is, Jesus came to restore heaven's rule on earth. Now to the book of Mark, which is the next book in the Bible. And in Mark, the author is giving us a different picture. He's giving us a different angle. He's showing us that Jesus came to be a servant. And of course, the author is Mark, and it's important to note, he's a first-generation Christian. So chances are he didn't personally, if he did, he would, be, would have been very young. He didn't personally experience his, Jesus' earthly ministry. But I love the fact that he was the first generation of the followers of Jesus that would come. And, and research tells us that he was uh, a disciple of, of Peter, and then he was ultimately a companion of Paul. So he was around these incredible, incredible mentors. And out of that passion, likely the passion of Paul, he wrote his book with an audience to the Romans, which explains a lot about this book. This book is written in a, at an incredible speed. So there's no genealogy, because why would you want to know the genealogy of a servant? Romans were interested in action. Tell me what happened. Tell me why I should believe. And that's exactly what the book does. So if you like action movies, if you're like a Hallmark movie person, I mean, you still need to read Mark, but you might wanna start with John. We'll talk about that in a minute. If you're like, hey, action is where I'm at, then start with the book of Mark because when you jump in, it's, it is moving and it is moving fast because he's wanting to make sure we recognize that Jesus is one who is able. He can not just talk the talk, he can walk the talk. And so there's an opening with you know, no genealogy, it's straight to baptism, straight to temptation, and then he records a ton of miracles. In fact, we get, there's 37 miracles of Jesus recorded in the Gospels, 22 of those are in the book of Mark. He is a God who is able, and he came to serve mankind, to meet them right there in their place of need. And it's really cool, it actually closes with Jesus giving, just like in Matthew, that authority that he has to his disciples, and his disciples are now doing, just as we're called to, they're the ones doing the miracles. And by the way, we still believe, we're a church that believes in miracles. And I'm grateful that the book of Mark shows us these miracles. And here's the ultimate message, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. That is just, I mean, we could camp out here for the next year, a God, the God of the universe who came to serve, to wash feet. What a beautiful picture. I'm so grateful for the book of Mark. Into the book of Luke. And in Luke, we see Jesus as the son of man. So he's fully God and he's fully man. And it is so intentional that God chose a doctor, Luke, who is a doctor, to write this because who better to write about humanity than a doctor because the doctor is so connected to the human experience. 
And Luke is the only author of the Gospels that was not Jewish. He was Gentile. And so his audience was actually the Greeks. He was writing to his own people. Uh, He understood the culture. He understood the art, the poetry. And the book of Luke is full of that kind of stuff, uniquely filled with the song of Mary and Zechariah and the angels bursting into song. And it's, it's, it's full of this beautiful, basically human experience of Jesus where we get the virgin birth and depth of his childhood. Uh, Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, all these unique features. Uh, Luke is unique in the fact that it highlights the role of women and how important women were for the journey, which would have been very countercultural in that time to write about all the women and how important they were to the life uh, of, of Jesus. And ultimately, all along the way, they're just, he's just showing us the humanity of Jesus. Y'all, this is where we get the prodigal son. This is where we, where, where we get the good Samaritan. This is where we get the thief on the cross and understanding you know, the hurt and pain of humanity and the opportunity for God to come in to serve. Uh, the, the genealogy we get in Luke it actually goes backwards from Mary to Adam, showing how connected to humanity um, Jesus is. And it closes with the ascension of Jesus. And ultimately the message is Jesus came to restore a broken world. And finally we get the book of John and uh, I, I love this book. Uh, so the first three books, this would just be a fun fact, uh, are called Synoptic Gospels. Uh, they are very similar in style and, and, and the way that they're laid out. And then you get John. Come on, John is just different. Everybody say different. different. And I love that it's different. I'll tell you why in a moment, because God's intentionality, you know, he had written a specific account to the people of the day. You know, he had written to uh, the Jews and the Greeks and the Romans, but he chose John the Beloved around AD 70 likely, right after the fall of Jerusalem, to write to a different audience, to all who would believe. No matter where you start, here's a pathway to Jesus. Oh, isn't that amazing? The Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, to all of us. And I love this, in fact, many people suggest reading the book of John, if you wanna start, I was sharing about Mark earlier, if you're, if you're starting from a new believer, then start at John. John's a beautiful way to be ushered into this story. And it's really written ultimately to show the deity of Jesus. So he's the fully, fully man, he's fully God. So his, his book opens in the beginning, <laughs> before there was time. This Jesus, you can trace his lineage to Adam. You can trace his royal heritage. He's this servant, but he was there in the beginning. And the book focuses on the perfection and completion of Christ. You get this rhythm in John of, you know, seven witnesses and seven I am's and these seven miracles. Every chapter in the book of John mentions the deity of God, of Jesus as God. You get this amazing illustrations, ways for us to connect with God, that God is light and God is bread and God is water and all this essentially, which is an invitation to humanity. In fact, this is how John ends. He says, Literally, the, the purpose of the book is in the last verses of the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And that's, man, I, with all of my, that's my heart today for all of us, that we would just, you know, have the spirit of, this is just an introduction, but that we would just keep digging into God's word but it's not ever just head knowledge. It's not ever just to do it. It's never, listen, our faith is not religion. Our faith is relationship. We're we're digging into this so that we may believe and believe more and believe more and that our faith can grow and that we can experience the fullness of who God is. And the gospels are just a beautiful way for us to see that and experience that. But that's not just the gospels. It's the entire word of God. If today and this series, it's just like, oh my goodness, I gotta have more and I gotta have it now. Two things practically I'd love you to write down. One, At Highlands College, we actually offer in our evening program a Bible study certificate. We actually also have a theology certificate. And we actually have an opportunity next semester, if you wanna jump in, we have um, dozens of of people here at Highlands who are already in this certificate and it's just a way to go deeper. And then for all of us, we have a great opportunity through small groups. We actually have a curriculum and there are groups happening now that are using this and a chance this spring, again, to jump in and, and maybe lead a group or be a part of a whole curriculum a whole semester around experiencing God's word. And if those things interest you, we would love you at every location to help you uh, with next steps towards evening. In fact, we have a preview day coming up this week. You can go to highlandscollege.edu and also with small groups. So as I prayed about how to end today, um, I was having a conversation with our faculty at Highlands College, just talking about 
um, the gospel and just talking about the, the power of God's word. And one of our uh, faculty members, he's actually in the service on the front row, uh, soon to be Dr. John Ball, um, offered to write out, because um, I was like, I don't want to just end with, inf- like, it, not, this is not just, inf- none of it's just information, but I don't want to just end with kind of this framework. I want to end with just an invitation, the kind of invitation that Jesus, um, if we were able to take the whole Bible and summarize it in about a minute and a half, the kind of invitation we think Jesus might offer. And he wrote it out for me. And in fact, it's on the app. You can get the whole story. But I just want to, if you maybe put your notes down for now, I just, just as a reminder or maybe an introduction, uh, let's, just, let's just go on the journey because at the end of the day, the gospel is a story. It's a story that we've been invited into. And C.S. Lewis says, it's the true myth. It's the story of all stories. It's the only one that is authentic and real. And of course, PC shared last week in the Old Testament, in the beginning, God created us for relationship with him. But that relationship is immediately broken through sin. And there's a disconnect between us and God, which grieves the heart of God. And so there's an immediate step towards God to begin to create what in the Old Testament is a sacrificial system, a way to restore relationship through animal sacrifice. But here's the big idea. It was never intended to last. It was an imperfect imperfect covenant. And so through the sequence of time, we see the prophet Jeremiah prophesy of this new covenant. There's a moment where God's gonna restore the promise. He's gonna restore the relationship. And the whole Old Testament is that journey and that waiting and that longing for the restoration of relationship. And the Old Testament ends where we ended last week with 400 years of silence. And then in Bethlehem, in a manger, (laughs) that silence is broken. And the perfect gift of God, the king, a servant, the son of man and son of God is born. And he lives a perfect life, the life we should have lived. And he ministers and he shows us through his life and his ministry what life was meant to be, what he calls abundant life. It's not the life you would experience in brokenness. It's a different kind of life. And that life leads him all the way at 33 years old to the cross. He's arrested. He's tried and convicted, even though he is innocent, he's convicted and he is sentenced to death to pay a price that I and you and we should have paid. And he willingly accepts that punishment and what is called the great reversal. He goes to that cross and he dies the death we should have died. And he in return, he gives us the righteousness that we never deserved. But the story doesn't end on the cross, does it? If it did, it would be a good story, but not the great story of the gospel because he's put into a tomb. And three days later, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he comes out of that tomb alive. And death is defeated. That's the day that death dies forever through the power of Jesus. And he ascends, he ascends. He ascends. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, descends and lives now to all inside of all who would believe so that we can have the restoration of the relationship that was broken in Genesis 1. And now we have the opportunity to live that abundant life, to experience that abundant life. But hey, here's the last good news, and we're gonna pray together today. It's not just here on earth, but it's for all eternity. This is the gospel. Last question of the day, and we're gonna pray together. Zen, how do we experience it? And there's a lot of verses. This is the one that just spoke to me the most. Matthew chapter 11. You want to experience the story that you've heard today? Come to me. Experiencing this gospel. It's not here. It's not in our actions. It's in our heart that we would come to Jesus as Lord and Savior. He says, come. And this is, if this describes you, this is you're in the perfect place today. All, ye, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you that abundant life. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. God's not mad at you. God's not angry at you. God's not frustrated with you. I love that he describes it. If you want to know my personality, it's gentle and lowly. It is gentle and humble in heart. And if you come to me just as you are, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can we put our hands together and thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a holy moment. Would you bow your heads? I just wanna pray for anyone who needs to come to Jesus today. The invitation has already been laid out. There's really no other words I need to say. You're tired, you're weary, you're worn out. 
Maybe for you, that's been your experience all of your life, or maybe for you, you've known God in the past, but you've walked away from him. So today's an invitation for those for the first time to experience salvation, to come to Jesus for the first time for a real relationship, and for those who just need to recommit their lives. But this is a holy moment. All of humanity, or history of humanity has been to build to moments like this, where God's message can pierce our hearts. And if that's what's happened today, I'm just gonna simply count to three, and every head's bowed and every eye's closed. I'm gonna give you a chance to boldly lift your hands. And what's gonna happen then is we're gonna pray together. I'm not gonna call you down front. We're gonna pray together and give you a chance to live out the verse we just read and to come to Jesus. Don't hold back. If that's you, you know it. Every location, online, even on demand, on the count of three, if you wanna get saved today or recommit your life, raise your hands. One, two, three. Come on, if that's you today, would you lift your hands? Amen, awesome. Amen, right there, awesome. All over the room, right there in the back. I see your hands. Come on, anyone else? I see those hands right there. Great job. Great job. If I saw your hands, or even if I didn't, I see your hand. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand right there. Awesome. So powerful. You can pray this prayer. You can just pray it in your own heart or even whisper it out loud, but just say, Jesus, today I come to you. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sin, my mistakes. I turn away from all of that. And I am turning to you. Be my Lord, my Savior, and fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you for the rest of my life. God, right now, I pray for all those who just made that decision. Blessing on them. Your word says the old has gone, the new has come. They are a new creation in you, and now they're a part of the story of God. And God, finally, I pray for all of us today. God, I'm praying specifically for a spirit in all of our hearts to keep digging, to working out our salvation, to keep going back for more. God, I pray that this entire series, today in this entire series, would whet our appetite, would create a hunger. And God, that we would take our eyes off the things around us and we would put our eyes on you more and more. And God, may your word come alive inside of us so that we can live, God, from its nourishment, so it can light our path, so it can build our faith. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for all those who just gave their heart to Jesus.